Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of This or That. And today we're going to be talking about the pros and cons of seeding your cycle for your new saltwater aquarium versus using a bottled bacterial approach. I got Kyle in the studio with me today, so we're gonna go ahead and get into it. Kyle, if you're starting a new aquarium, which way are you going? Um, if, you, if you had to pick one. If I had to pick one, I'd probably go bottled bacteria. You're gonna go bottled bacteria? Yeah. All right, so I want, let's just start there. Why? Why you say Why? that? Um, no, I, wanna, I wanna hear it. It's a couple of benefits. Typically, if you're using bottled bacteria, you're starting off with dry rock, which means you've got no pests to start off your tank. You're starting off your journey nice and easy. Mm -hmm. Only thing that's in there is what you're adding. Yeah, so that, that's a great point. So if, if you're one of these folks that you, you want to know everything that's going into your aquarium, which to some extent, even, no matter how hard you try, it's going to be out of your control at some point. But if you want to at least try to have as much control of that as possible, maybe the bottle bacterial approach is great for you. Seeding, if you're seeding the tank, maybe with a piece of live rock or some other media, sand, whatever it is from something, from, a, from a, maybe a mature system somewhere, you are probably going to bring in things that you don't know. That you don't know you're putting in there, possibly things you don't want. Uh, so, so that's a great point. If you're going for that like sterile approach, maybe a bottle yeah. of bacteria is a good a good way to go. Yeah, I think the other aspect I like about it is if you're using dry rock, you have a plenty of time to aquascape. If you're using something like a seeded live rock, live sand, you have to keep that stuff wet. You're, uh, yeah, you have a little bit of time to make a really cool aquascape. That's a great point. That's a great point. So yeah, that, that that's actually one I hadn't really thought of. But yeah, I mean if you're that's perfect. Like you can just have it sitting there dry. You can mess with your, your aquascape over and over and over again until you get it just like you want it and then start up your tank and your cycle. Where yeah, if you're using live rock, you're kind of pressed for time. You can't leave it half built, come back to it later and then, you know, yeah. a couple of days later and work on it. So that's that's great. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. It's the calm before the storm of having a reef tank sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, the pest free is great, you know, and, you know, and for the most part, we don't really do a lot with live rock anymore. I mean, you don't you don't see a lot of people starting tanks out with live rock. There's not a lot of places that are selling it still. I think it's starting to become a little bit more or some of the aquaculture stuff are starting to show back up. But for the most part, you're not going to see that. So there's there's very little risk, even if you're using, say, a cultured or, you know, some live rock from a mature system. Maybe a, a local fish store has some like in a tub somewhere or something like that. Probably low risk of getting things like you know, some sort of a nasty crab or a mantis shrimp or something like that. And it's always a possibility. Um, but what I find more than anything, usually in some of that old live rock from some local fish store, what I usually find in it is a, uh, like some aptasia and a crack or something somewhere that, you know, you never knew existed. Cause that's usually somebody tear that somebody, some customer tore down a tank and all went into a tub somewhere. And now somebody's trying to recycle that. So uh, just be cognizant of that. If you're going to use live rock to cycle your tank, you know, you, you want to make sure you're getting it from somewhere you trust and hopefully it's a pest free thing, but that's where bottled bacteria works great. Yeah. So you don't have to worry about that. Pest free. Um, other aspect I like about it is you have full control of the cycle. You start the cycle when you want to, you add the ammonia source, you add the bacteria, you're off to the races. Right. Yeah. So don't even die off from the live rock either. Get off to do what? No, di no die off. No die off, off from the live rock. Right. So, which, which in some cases that can just start your cycle. I mean, that can help your cycle really. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I mean, I've always had better luck with and a quicker cycle when I'm seeding. Now, now to say that, you also don't need, if you're going to seed, you don't need like a full rock structure of exactly. live rock, right? You can literally seed it, which is a little bit. Um, I've used um, bio balls, like the, the clay oh, yeah. or bio blocks from like a mature system. Or if I have one tank that's mature and it's well cycled, I'll grab a few of those bio, those, you know, clay balls from that and put those into a, a new sump or something just to get that bacterial colony or that that colonization started, get that seeding process going. So, um, what else? Any other advantages? Um, I would say the other big advantage for me is just it's more affordable. You're doing dry rock, costs way less per pound than typical live rock does. If you're doing live rock, it ranges anywhere from like twelve to twenty five dollars a pound. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're doing something like Marco rocks, you're paying like three dollars a pound. Yeah, yeah, the cat. Yeah, exactly. So it's going to be way cheaper usually. With the market yeah, rockers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It depends on how big your tank is and all that stuff. Another thing that I like to take here, or I was taking into consideration, is the, the ugly phase, oh, right? Yeah. Which is inevitable anytime you're setting up a tank. You're going to see it to some degree, sometimes less than others. But what I have found, in I guess in my experience, that if you're using a seeded tank or you're, you're seeding it with live rock, live sand, whatever it might be, or just all live rock, the ugly phase, in my opinion, it seems to happen quicker, like sooner, and it doesn't last as long. It's like it, if it's like a flash in the pan. Everything looks terrible for like a week or less, and then it just kind of goes away. Um, 
And in my, in my opinion, those tanks have also been a little bit more, uh, for lack of a better term, bulletproof to yep. you know, issues, uh, you know, cyano outbreaks, things like that later on in the future than these tanks that I've used, um, you know, like a bacterial seed on. Not that either one's, again, either one's necessarily correct or the best no. way or whatever, yeah. but that's, that's my experience, what I've seen out of it. I would say I do tend to agree with that. I was going to say back when I first started in this hobby uh, 16 years ago, when everyone was using live rock, dinoflagellates were like non-existent. Like it was a rare thing for someone to have that issue. Yeah. But seems like nowadays it's something that happens at every single tank. Yeah, I don't think until until recently when I started, I guess, you know, pretty much only doing, um, you know, bottled bacteria cycles did I really start like, have, ever having these dino outbreaks in my things. That's a, that's yeah. a great point, actually. Cyano, that would always come up every now and then, yeah. but typically you could knock it out pretty quick. Um, but dinos is sort of a, I don't know, it seems like it's more of a problem than it ever used to be. You know, things like green hair algae and all that stuff is always higher, right. but. I will take green hair algae and cyano over dinos any day. Any day. <laughs> it, any day, right? Yeah, I, I can't handle the the snotty, stringy stuff floating around in the water. It drives me absolutely bonkers. So, okay, so that covers, we've covered a lot on the bottled bacteria stuff. Let's yeah. let's talk a little bit more about using live rock or live sand and some, maybe some pros and cons, tips and tricks there. Yeah. What do you got? Um, I would say my first tip is uh, make sure that you find a quality source for your live rock. Um, don't just trust any random source because some people might be tearing down their tank, but they might be tearing down their tank because they had a dino issue or right. they may have a huge vermited snail outbreak. Uh, that's, just, yeah. that's, that's just starting yourself off on the wrong foot for your journey. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've actually seen those tanks where somebody's breaking it down because they've got so many vermited snails they don't know what to do with. And they're just like, forget it, I'm done with it. And they just break down their tank. And then, yeah, you're just going to put those in yours. And maybe that's not what you want. So that, that's a great point. Always know you're getting it from a reputable source. If you are going to get something from, like, so this aquacultured rock, like you can buy some from like Florida and things like that, yeah. that, are, that they're you know, actually just putting out in the water for a while, out in the reef, letting it colonize, and then they bring it back. Just know you're going to get a little bit of a mixed bag there, but you're also going to get instant microfauna. You're going to yeah. get an instant ecosystem in your aquarium, right? Uh, now it's going to go through some ebb and flow and it's going to go through that natural cycle, but you're going to end up with things in there that you never could have gotten through a bottled, bottled bacterial process. Yeah. Um, and one of my favorite things that I've, I've noticed in a lot of new tanks just don't have, which was really common to see in older tanks that use live rock was, you know, like sponges. Just, oh yeah. Like the little, like the blue encrusting sponges and things like that all over the rock work. And those guys are just in there. They're filter feeding, they're helping the ecosystem out. So that was always one thing I, I, I used to love looking at that stuff, those yep. little nuance things in there. And I didn't even mind, like if I got like a weird crab or something, it wasn't the end of the world for me. I'd just be like, ah, whatever. Uh, I did the worst thing I ever got from live rock, uh, was actually a, a snail that, Stop. uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was, yes. it was a snail that lived in the sand bed and he ate clams. I found out very quickly that I could not keep clams in that particular reef tank. Like, so I just, I just owned it. I was like, oh, there's no clams in this tank. There's worse pests to have. Yeah. That's for uh, sure. Yeah. And I could, I could never find him, never saw him. Uh, just every time I put a clam in there about a week later, he'd die and there'd be a little pinhole size, just perfect circle drill hole through his shell. That was the end of it. So. I will say one of the pros with that biodiversity is I just love looking at the live rock and finding all the little critters that come in on it. I mean, when honestly, I first got the hobby, that honestly, was like my favorite part. Yeah, it was one of the coolest things when you were setting up a new tank and you you had access to that live rock. You never knew what you were going to get. It, that was also, it was mystery yeah, bag. It was a little bit of a mystery bag. Sometimes it didn't work out. Most of the time, it was like, man, hey, that's pretty cool. And half the stuff that was on it died. But I even got, I there was a couple times where I'd get like a, like a little porites coral or something like that on it that would show up or a really cool, like just like that, like a really cool blue or pink sponge or something. And I was just like, that's awesome. And yeah. let it roll. So you, you do get that interesting sort of instant biodiversity that you yep. wouldn't get with, with uh, the bottled approach. But um, the other thing is uh, another thing that I think you kind of lose is that, that natural look to it. There are a lot of dry rocks now that they have like the, the, you know, the, the purple coating on them to make it look like coral algae. I'm not necessarily a fan. It looks great. And some, I've seen it look great. Um, but I, I also just try to keep in mind that most of that's probably going to get covered yeah. by like either coral and algae or coral itself. So it's not really that important, but I always find that at least for a while, especially during the ugly phase that, you know, that white, like the Marco rock or something like that, it, it, it's going to look pretty bad for a while. 
I love, yeah, it does take a little while for those white rocks to really get matured and change color and mm -hmm. get covered up with coralline algae and other yeah. natural microfauna. But um, the live rock, I do think is a little bit hard to aquascape with just because it is very natural in shape. It's usually yeah. like broken apart. Sometimes it's hard to get things to stick together the way you want to, to make the aquascape that you want. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you had to, you would have to use, or what I used to have to use was the two, you know, the two part putty epoxy and smash it. You know, it's harder. Cause like you said earlier, you can't dry it out or you don't want to dry it out. Cause that's so bad. It defeats the purpose, right? right? It defeats the purpose. So you can't really use like a mortar or something to really get these things adhered together. So it really was a bit of a, a game of, Jenga, right? Getting everything yeah. balanced in there just the way you wanted it. And then maybe go around and like putty some of the, the joints so that they didn't move. But other than that, yeah, it was a stacking process. That kind of goes over some of the, you know, if you're talking about going one way or the other, we've kind of touched on some of the pros and cons there. I think one of the other things, uh, just to mention real quickly, we talked about, you know, the live rock having that nice natural look with all the coral and algae, dry rock doesn't. Um, one approach that you could take to that. And this is sort of a hybrid approach, right? And so if we start getting into that, like, what if you just did both? Is there a problem with that? Right? So you've got the Marco rock or you've got the, the dry rock, but you also want to, you want to get that coral and algae going. You want to get that natural look to it. There are things you can do to, to boost that. Yeah, right? exactly. And, and get that going. So there are a few places out there though, there are some bottled coral and algae options. Actually, yeah. um, there's a, a, a place that I've ordered from, I think, and a lot of a lot of folks have in the hobby. It's called Indo Pacific Indo Pacific Sea Farms. They actually sell a coral and algae booster, which I mean, literally, they just send you just like a plate, plate yeah. of coral and algae, and you can just break that up and throw in your tank, and that'll seed the coral and algae process. So, lots of things you can do there if you're going for a hybrid approach. Yeah, I mean, similar to the um, Indo Pacific Sea Farms, you can, if you have a bite that's already in the hobby, has a really well established tank, back walls covering coral and algae, you can scrape it off the back of their tank, put it in your tank. Just a fair warning, make sure they don't have Aptasia because we've done that here a few times at BRS where we actually gave in all their tanks Aptasia because we do that same approach. Yeah, yeah, which is always fun, right? Yeah. And at least you can track it back to the source. But yeah, so keep that in mind. Uh, again, know where you're getting it from. I've I've always had really good luck with uh, IPSF, so um, yeah. maybe try those guys. Um, I highly recommend it. But, you know, it's never a bad idea to go with that hybrid approach. If I do it nowadays, when I do this, I will usually take and do like when I'm building a new tank, sorry, I'll, I'll do the dry rock. I'll build like a really cool rock structure with the Marco rock or, or something. And then I'll seed it either with a temporary piece of live rock, just in the tank itself, or I'll get some biomedia, like say a, like a bio block or some of the, the biospheres and from my, from my sump, in an established tank and I'll just put that in the sump of my new tank and let that start that bacterial cycle. Cause that's, I mean, that's about as good as it gets. You've got an established tank that's going well, mature. It's got all the stuff you need. Just, you know, throw that right into your tank. Yeah. I also like that approach. That's personally how I've done all of my last tanks. Um, my last tank here, I got rubble from William here, who's the tank technician. Mm -hmm. I grabbed some rubble from our tub over in the lab and yeah. just put that in my sump. That's how I kickstart everything off after using dry rock on the display. Yeah, and it speeds things up tremendously. I'm a, uh, a big proponent of that. You know, anything that you can do to speed that cycle up and get things going quicker, it's just going to make you happier and make your tank look better and get you closer to starting to add some cool creatures to it. So, but either way you go, if you're going to go with a bottled approach or you're going to go with a seed cycle, whatever it is, depending on, again, the type of person you are and what kind of reef you're going for, uh, just be patient. All right. Every tank has a little bit of a different cycle time. There's general ideas, you know, like a two to three months, whatever it's going to be for that full cycle to let yep. to go through. Um, it's going to be a little shorter, maybe if you go with a seeding or a live rock only, but either way, be patient, let it ride out. You'll get through there. So yeah. Any, any last thoughts or. Yeah. Uh, I would say just enjoy the cycle. It's a great time to learn about patience in the hobby because nothing good happens fast with any of our tanks. Um, and also just be ready to have that ugly face. I think 99.9% .9 of reavers go through an ugly phase. Just plan for it to happen. Mm -hmm. Don't be disgruntled or upset that it happens. Just write it through. Once you get through it, you'll thank yourself for learning the patience and having a great looking tank. Yeah, so, for sure. And, and I think you nailed it. And that's one of my favorite phrases I use. Nothing in this hobby, nothing good in this hobby or that happens in your tank is going to happen fast. All right? Yeah. So... All right, folks. Well, hey, thanks for joining us. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and I hope this helps you decide one way or the other how you're going to cycle that new saltwater tank that you've got. We'll see you guys next time.